And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. What a fantastic crowd we have out there tonight in the Ideas Room. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, it looks like that uh, new Twitter CEO is kind of the meme of the day. Yes, she is. <laughs> this is an interesting choice. Um, this is somebody who was, you know, World Economic Forum and NBC Universal and Biden vaccine promo. I mean, this is a a disastrous choice. So it gets us into the real reason why uh, our friend Elon is there in the driver's seat at Twitter. And we're going to get into that. And we're going to get into X and what he plans to bring out to everyone and where it comes from. Because, you know, a lot of articles have been coming out and being like, we don't know anything about Elon's obsession with X. Where did it come from? Well, I'm going to tell you tonight. <laughs> uh, we have a very special report here. This is Here Comes X. And that's going to include the UFO file. It's going to include the 2024 campaign. And of course, Mr. Musk is sitting right in the middle of all that. Um, this is a special report. We'll go about 90 minutes tonight. And we'll take your questions in the second half of the program. Of course, uh, we ran Dr. Farrell's uh, second part, part two interview for everyone uh, last night. And that had a great response. Really interesting, that combination and sort of, wrapping up the whole Giza Death Star uh, book series that he had really started out maybe in like 2004, 2005, somewhere back there. Very interesting uh, concepts and everything from the Great Pyramid to Tesla being involved there and going back again into this ancient idea of ancient technology at the Giza Plateau, which we know through the mystery schools uh, goes back a long, long time, way before recorded history. And, um, Nothing in recorded history has ever come close to the kind of detailed uh, way in which those records were kept by the same uh, priest who gave the information to Solon, who passed it on to Plato. So this is a long, long tradition. And um, that plays in tonight because there's a space part and there's an ancient part. <laughs> and there's a mystery school part and there's a deep state part. That's why this is such a special report. I'm going to try to get them all in but we will take your questions uh, for the last half hour and you can ask those of Miss Olivia now and she'll put them together for everyone. Uh, how are we doing out there? Doing great. Wonderful questions coming in already. Fantastic. Um, Scarlet Fire wants to know, do you think Musk got pressured? Yes. Oh, yeah. You have to remember, um, Musk at that level, everything that he does is, is the actions of multiple people. So if you study the bio of Howard Hughes, you get kind of a good idea of this. And it's interesting because the man who fell to earth, which is the 1976 or 75 movie with David Bowie and uh, Nicholas Rogue and um, Candy Clark, Candy Clark, Candy Clark, outstanding. But it's very interesting because there's a lot, a lot of parallels in that movie because after all in the movie, like Howard Hughes, he starts this corporation, and then the whole goal is to get into space, like Howard Hughes. You know, Howard Hughes is very often remembered in this way. It's this kind of like drugged out, germaphobe, you know, Las Vegas hotel room thing. But the truth is, the entire endeavor of Howard Hughes from really the late 40s on, well, actually, even earlier, if you think about it, but it was just aerospace because he was a pilot and because he was plugged in to that whole piece. And once he learned about the X technology, he, uh, he became a threat inside. And so they controlled him more and more. But oddly enough, there's a very interesting chapter in history back there, which has to do with RFK Jr.'s dad, Bobby Kennedy. And um, RFK Jr. and Trump both come up tonight because this 2024 election is shaping up to be the transparency test for the world and can the world take it? You know, can they handle the truth? This is going to be an interesting point because the person who delivers that transparency is going to have a tremendous advantage against this incredible flood of misinformation. Uh, that's going to be, we're already seeing heavy, heavy duty uh, strafing runs in that regard, especially on um, Bobby Kennedy. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the actual stats of his candidacy, they're doing fantastic. I saw a poll recently that had him as high as 31 points. Uh, there's a phenomenal sort of desire to get out of this situation 
uh, with Stepford Biden and his regime and all the havoc that they're causing. So um, it's absolutely crucial that people on the Republican side, the independent side, the Democratic side, all unite to get rid of the Biden regime because of the disastrous policies that they've led us into abroad and at home, too numerous to detail here, and they take up the full 90 minutes, I'm sure. But um, I think there's something, there's a feeling underneath that we've been played long enough. And that's why I think Bobby's candidacy is so strong coming out of the gate. Now they're doing a lot to knock it down. And um, they did a lot to knock down Trump's candidacy with the CNN town hall and what happened. It turned around. It backfired. <laughs> if that isn't Mercury retrograde, I don't know what <laughs> is. Uh, it was a phenomenal performance by Trump because they threw everything in the kitchen sink at them. And this is a weird thing that they should have learned their lesson about Trump, which is never have him live and try to dump everything on him because there's an incredible chameleon quality and uh, he can move around and bob and weave like nobody's business. He also, and, he's just great in front of a live audience. That's yes. his domain. Uh, and it's amazing too, because, you know, this is someone who went into the lion's den with CNN and afterwards they were like, oh, we apologize for that terrible. Can we, you know, they had Anderson Cooper on to cry on, on screen, but it is interesting um, when they, they walked into that one with Trump. And for me, um, you know, it gets into this thing about Trump has the issues and it's an interesting thing because it was the most exciting moment of the campaign so far. And, uh, cause the campaign is definitely on and it's on, you know, it has to be heavy duty on all fronts at this point. So everyone is jumping in early and, uh, uh hitting it hard because between here and next November, you're going to hear just about as much, you know, how much distortion can over a trillion dollars buy? Well, we're going to hear it and find out. Um, but it is fascinating to me because in those polls, uh, and it's very hard for the Democrats to hide these because there's so many of them now, but Trump is doing astonishingly well and it shows that people are just really tired of this terrible administration and their economic policies, and their war policies. But also that, um, you know, Trump, the one thing that he's really good at and he has a fantastic advantage over the current administration on uh, with Stepford Biden is the economy. People understand and trust him uh, with that. And it's a crucial, crucial piece. And on the other uh, front, we have Bobby Kennedy coming in strong and showing up the Biden administration by pointing out his heavy, and I mean heavy duty differences with them. Um, you know, there's an incredible push inside the DNC to just reelect Biden or to have someone replace him. Uh, on their side, they don't want anything about, you know, primaries or <laughs> legitimate democracy. That's long gone with those people. So we have an interesting situation there where a real upset is brewing on the Kennedy side. So the entire media machine is now hoisting itself against him. Uh, <laughs> that was the triumphant shot of Trump at that <laughs> town hall. <laughs> Something about that picture says it all. I almost don't have to add anything, but um you know, they, they sent in this real kind of, uh, she was doing a terrible job and she was being rude. And if you want to make a point with somebody, you know, the whole point of a town hall is let them say their thing. And if they fall on their face, the audience doesn't like it or whatever, but you don't go there as a debate partner and try to skewer them. But this is the, the goal of these people. Uh, but they got it back pretty heavy duty. And if anything, I think this town hall helped Trump dramatically. In fact, uh, his numbers are way up. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the bounce he needed on the independent side. The other thing is that, um, you know, they've been doing so much with these cases uh, and regardless of where you fall on Trump or whatever, the idea of just hounding somebody with cases because you're afraid of them politically it starts to get tired. People, you know, spot it. And it's interesting because when he raised the idea that you can't get a fair trial in New York City, <laughs> if you're him especially, the whole place erupted with applause. You know, uh, it sounded like <laughs> the Beatles at Shea Stadium or something. So they get it. You know, uh, that was the first real test, and that was New Hampshire. The next test in New Hampshire is Bobby Kennedy's candidacy because what's happening there, as I pointed out uh, in the previous episode is the Biden administration trying to just get rid of and bypass New Hampshire because they do so poorly there. 
and Biden lost, you know, he got, he only raised eight percentage points last time. So it's just a terrible uh, retail candidate. And all they can do is hoist this kind of, you know, dead brain figure in front of a camera at this point and pray to God the drugs work and he can read the teleprompter. But um, I think what we have to do is look at New Hampshire as the real canary in the coal mine for the whole thing. Because if Bobby puts the right uh, effort in there and puts, you know, really takes the gloves off against Biden and points this whole thing out, if he wins triumphantly and they'll say, oh, we're not even going to compete, it doesn't matter. You compete just by the fact that you're the president. And um, so the whole idea that they're trying to rig the DNC against him might backfire on them. It might be the worst strategy they could adopt. And then the people who don't think that Biden can take on Trump inside the Democratic Party may be looking at that and saying, oh, if he falls on his face, you know, we'll go down the line with our Hillary, Michelle Obama, that whole trip. But in the meantime, Bobby Kennedy is coming forward with a lot of really good um, policy positions and that transparency has not stopped since he started running for president. Here we have now on my show here uh, two years ago, he went on the record about the CIA assassinating uh, his uncle and being involved in his dad's murder. So um, here we have this kind of going around as a major news story now because of the level of transparency that he's getting as a as a presidential candidate, you don't see this. And it's Robert Kennedy Jr. blames CIA for JFK assassination, fueling controversial claim. So uh, you're seeing this everywhere now. And of course, you know, he's put it on the record. He put it on the record here and in other places. Um, so this, this is just now catching on. And this is the delayed reaction thing that we see in so many different uh, pieces. But here, if you're in the ideas room or you're doing the X show, you know, when they talk about, well, actually, you know, Trump and Nixon were very close. <laughs> Nixon tried to guide Trump um, in the 80s and like shared a lot of information with him. You already knew that if you watch this show, but it took the mainstream media till 2021 to be like, well, you know, the Nixon Foundation let out all these letters and it's true. Well, this is the nature of, of, the, of the kind of research that we do. Here's another one. Inside RFK Jr.'s kooky White House quest. It's kooky. How about that? Isn't that great journalism? Mm. An older generation of Kennedys sold hope. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is definitely offering something weirder. Yeah. <laughs> Spectator. Um, they have a lot of contempt for the Kennedys because the Kennedys showed up the system and the CIA runs that machine of the media. So they in particular want to cover up the crime there um, because to have the Central Intelligence Agency held accountable for the assassination of the Kennedy brothers, president and senator. Um, you know, that's that's pretty heavy duty. That's not something they can walk back and that they've known that. That's why they've hid the records for all these years. Um, but Bobby's candidacy alone is bringing this back on them. So we're in a real interesting situation. Now, he's been making all the right moves, and it's funny because as um, Elon stepped in it with this World Economic Forum <laughs> woman as the new CEO, uh, he was actually calling them out, saying that the WEF and Bill Gates are using climate change to control the population. That's his stance. So, you know, he's coming on strong with the good positions, getting us out of Ukraine, um, you know, strengthening the border. He's actually adopting some very strong uh, positions that may appeal to Republicans as well. So we might be looking here at someone who's a real crossover candidate and can bring the full presidential uh, race to a halt by winning. Focus groups, Georgia swing voters want Biden to debate RFK Jr. Biden is hiding. He's hiding Biden. And uh, he's hanging out there in the background and his handlers are like, we cannot let this guy anywhere near Stepford Biden, because, you know, Bobby Kennedy is smart. <laughs> uh, he's been an environmental lawyer three decades, and he has that incredible uh, background, Harvard, London School of Economics, you know, Virginia Law School. I mean, this, this guy is off the charts. So um, what we're looking at there is they just have to run the clock out, try to run away from him. But while they're doing that, they're running into Trump. So if the pressure is coming in from the Kennedy side and coming in on the Trump side, I guarantee you the Biden candidacy, which is really weak and flailing will collapse. 
um, given the economic unrest and everything else that we're seeing. The only thing that can keep him in is emergency powers, and we're going to get to that in a minute as well. Everyone, it's great to have you all here. This is a special report going deep tonight, and it is X. Here it comes, X, Araman, Elon Musk, the UFO file, and the 2024 campaign. We're going to take, uh, in the short report now, we'll take about a half hour of your questions in the last half hour, and uh, you can ask those now. I'm going to remind you while I have your attention, especially if you're new here, to sign up for the newsletter because that's how we stay in touch and get past this incredible censorship that we've been dealing with uh, pretty much since day one, but boy, has it ramped up recently. <laughs> so uh, the best way to stay in touch is to make sure that you are on that newsletter list. It's a free newsletter. And, uh, you know, basically it lets you know things before anything hits and that includes interviews, uh, incredible X series episodes, some very exciting events we have coming up and some documentary announcements and things of this nature. Um, you know, when we did the Alex Jones show, uh, what was it? I think it was two weeks ago, but everyone got that in the newsletter first before anything. So they all were there and were able to hit that because we had to announce it pretty late. Um, so that's the way that that works. And, um, you know, it's a free newsletter. If you want to become a subscriber, get access to more and get it sooner, you know, you get episodes like the Farrell episode we ran last night, subscribers had that like three weeks ago. So if you want that level uh, of subscribership, just go in there. We've made that very affordable and very easy for you to get behind the program, the things that we do here. And we thank you all for your support. Okay, Miss Olivia, how mm -hmm. are you out there? Good. Do you want some political questions? Sure. Okay, so... Karen Carpenter, any comment about RFK Jr.'s tweet saying under no circumstances will he be on a ticket with Trump? Yeah, I have more on RFK here tonight. Um, it's important for him to clarify that now because what's going on is a lot of the people on the Republican side who were supposed to be in there kind of promoting Trump's candidacy have been letting it flail a little bit. And they were relying on this weird excitement factor of Bobby's campaign and saying, oh, we'll just join up with him. You know, Bobby has to win the Democratic nomination. He's a Kennedy. He's going for the Democratic nomination. And he plans to win against President Biden. Um, and on the Trump side, I think that was just a dangle out there. And they didn't really know what to do. The people working with his candidacy haven't really you know, what they need to do, and I'll tell them right now, it's a little free advice <laughs> from dark journalists, um, put together the 12 points of President Trump saving America. You know, I'm going to lower taxes. I'm going to firm up the border. I'm going to get us out of Ukraine. I'm going to ban, <clears throat> excuse me, the central bank digital currency things of this nature. This is what you need Trump to do. Just show up at each appearance and hammer those points home. Uh, you know, we don't need him getting into old fights with Nancy Pelosi or something. <laughs> Although those were great, you mm -hmm. know. Um, we need him to really lay out that campaign vision on his side. Here's my free advice for Bobby. Bobby needs to... Um, He's so different. He's so diametrically opposed to anything that President Biden is doing uh, in relation to censorship, in relation to corporate state um, influence, in relation to the war in Ukraine where lives are being lost daily. Um, and it's an incredible thing, the amount of uh, bodies that are piling up over there. And these are just, you know, innocent Ukrainian people being... Uh, kind of lulled into the situation and Russia thinking that they're protecting uh, their border, moving in there and saying no NATO and, you know, all this thing could have been solved with a good peace process. And Bobby is so diametrically opposed to the neocon aspect of the Biden administration, which, you know, is that direct neoliberal, um, you know, all the, the neocons just went from the Bush administration straight over to Biden's. And so he needs to take the gloves off in relation to that. He, he said, well, I don't want to be personal against President Biden, but I'm damn well against him on these things. And he's shown that. So he's using the, the right language, but he needs to be able to go after Biden. Uh, so take the gloves off, really differentiate your candidacy from 
the guy who's screwing everything up and is stumbling around there. Uh, you know, I wouldn't trust Biden to <laughs> drive himself home. I mean, he, he seems completely out of it. And if anything, you know, the people propping him up there, um, it, there's some, you know, case for that it's elder abuse. I think it's, it's borderline that. So borderline. Um, I've been it, saying that since the 2020 election. There's no question. And it's not his age. In fact, it is, you know, because we know people in their 80s who are very, very competent. But uh, this guy is just shot. He's gone. And there's, there's nothing in there except handlers in the background. So there's a committee running this guy, which is a very dangerous situation for us, especially with the neocons slowly creeping in and using bellicose uh, language against the Russians, who are a nuclear armed nation. And this is filtering down into the media. Uh, it was interesting. One of the questions that President Trump got from CNN was, who do you want to win? You know, and he said the right thing. He said, I'm more concerned with stopping the killing. And that's what our position should be. That's where we're coming from. And um, a real peace process is something that should be, you know, the absolute goal here, because uh, a country like Russia, one, we need them on our side. And two, for them to have, you know, they actually have more nuclear weapons than we do. But we solved all these problems in the late 80s with Gorbachev and Reagan. And there was a UFO file component there that might have to come to the surface again, because I already see signs that it may. Um, but that was a crucial aspect in them signing those agreements. And they lowered the stockpiles of dangerous nuclear weapons, which helps everyone across the board. So um, this is a kind of a sick situation that we're in. So Bobby can really take the lead because he is a peace candidate. Um, you know, and he's somebody who knows how to stand up for people. So in my opinion, here is someone that, you know, and I hear around independent media, they're like, you know, well, you know, he's not perfect on this or that. I mean, come on. <laughs> this is somebody who's calling out the CIA for assassinating a president who happens to be his uncle. Um, that level of transparency is what we need. This is a guy who wrote a book outlining the crimes of Dr. Fauci. Okay. And uh, Fauci and his weird Frankenstein movements go all the way back to the AIDS epidemic and the, the scam that he ran there. Um, so, you know, we've got a transparency candidate. Uh, no, no political person is going to be perfect or check all your boxes for positions. But I can tell you, we're going to need somebody honest um, and we're going to need some major, major transparency change for 2024. We cannot, and I mean the country will not survive the decade if we reelect the likes of Biden. And it absolutely has to be stopped. And it has to be stopped through this process of the pressure coming in from the resurgent Trump on one side and Bobby coming in on the Democratic side to cripple that administration. And then we can have a real campaign with real candidates. How would that be? <laughs> Amazing. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. Special report here. This is X. Here it comes. Well, what is X? I've been trying to tell you about X steganography on this program, and Elon Musk has been obsessed with X. Well, he had X.com all the way back in 2003. Well, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on in relation to that, because we're talking about X steganography, which refers to a system of understanding technology. Now, uh, the actual steganography piece is very ancient, but suffice to say, it basically rebounded, found itself in the 20th century in relation to this advanced technology that the government was moving from agency to agency, but needed a way to track it without tipping off anyone who was paying attention. So the X technology becomes in the central core piece going into the 21st century about who's got it. And we've seen those battles of steganography, of Jeff Bezos standing next to a gigantic X about Blue Origin. And SpaceX is a big piece of that as well. And they're all signaling to each other, for the people who know, we have this. We have the technology. Now, I've mentioned before, so just a quick summary, the X technology resides inside the UFO file inside the government. So um, that technology possesses qualities which are far outside of anything that we understand traditionally uh, in terms of you know where we think technology is at if you're the average guy on the street 
or gal. Now, interestingly enough, what's been going on in the background is every once in a while, weird stories and weird flaps have come out about UFOs, <laughs> strange stories about abductions, about incredible maneuvers, about physics-defying events, about time stopping, people missing time and all these things. This is all related directly to the technology that I'm discussing. The UFO phenomena is right in the heart of the whole thing. So when we get around Musk and we get around the things that he's been positioned to do by groups as diverse as DARPA or venture capital firms, Silicon Valley, um, we're looking at somebody who was put in a position very much like Howard Hughes again. This is the Tesla guy. Note the name very closely. This is the Twitter guy. This is the SpaceX guy. And now he's the XAI guy as well. And the X app, the everything app. This is all very well planned. And it's something, you know, I'm fond on this program. And I have a whole section on Rudolf Steiner because we have to get into Aramon to understand the X part of this tonight. But I'm fond of saying about Rudolf Steiner, he basically spent four decades trying in different ways <laughs> to explain the dangers of Armon and Armonic forces to us, meaning that there was a kind of a lower astral piece attached to this incredible technological boom. And that at a certain point that that presence was going to try to come through the technology. Now it's interesting too, um, you know, as I've spelled out many times in this program, I'm, I have a long track record background <laughs> of about 15 years with technology. I even edited a uh, tech magazine for 10 years. So this is not any kind of a technology is evil um, platform or anything like that. The technology is good. The way that it's used is going to be crucial and determine a lot in relation to the future. There's a group positioning themselves who want to use the technology no matter what, whatever cost to humanity to achieve this weird godlike status that they're looking for. Those groups are connected directly to what happens in Davos and with the World Economic Forum and others. The whole thing has been in play for a long time. Now, we've been outlining it on this program. One of the things I think that we need to get our heads wrapped around is X, Aramon, Elon, and the UFO file. These things all flow very easily together. And I'm going to show you exactly how, uh, before I jump into that, Miss Olivia. Um, <laughs> Rehoboth Farm wanted to remind us all about Elon Musk's boring companies. Yes. Uh, well, that's interesting because it's underground in Nevada, which is all of his companies are in Nevada. Isn't that interesting? That's where Area 51 is. So this, he's there, you know, he's kind of their poster guy for the X-Tech. <laughs> And um, he has, you know, he's made his own initiatives, but they've decided, you know what, they came forward and said, we're going to just merge this stuff behind you. All you have to do is go along with it. And that's what he's done. But at times, it seems to cost him, you know, it's like, what is the danger of a man gaining the whole world, but losing his own soul? It, there's a trick to the whole thing. And um, let's start with Steiner here and his characterization. Steiner, the Austrian mystic. I've done many programs on him and uh, I can recommend the shows that we've done and the shows that Gigi Young has done. Just remarkable overviews, getting to the core of what the eighth sphere is, what Armon is, what Steiner's teaching is. In short, um, Steiner's the Austrian mystic who came out of that theosophical tradition where he had led theosophical chapters for a decade. And this was the beginning of the public mystery schools coming through of the theosophy in 19th century. And then really turn of the century is Steiner. 1903, he's starting to kind of make a name for himself. And he'd already written a book on Nietzsche and um, Faust and things like that. Uh, but he, you know, this is when he's really starting to become a teacher. And um, he will be kind of, you know, work in tandem with the Theosophical Society for a long time. But at a certain point, he parts company because of the direction they're going in. And they've become kind of a plaything for all kinds of occult forces by the time he leaves. And he founds Anthroposophy, which is a mystery school, a public mystery school, but in the tradition 
of the Western initiation tradition, more of a Rosicrucian piece than, say, the Buddhist thing that theosophy was turning into. It didn't start like that. Um, so this East-West initiators piece becomes very important when you go back there. Steiner wanted to put a few things out there in, in a crucial sense. One was this whole presence of Ahriman as an influence coming in. And if you read a lot of those kind of uh, different lectures that he gave, the things that he was putting forward, you know, some of it reads just like it would be, oh, you know, this sounds like 1915, you know, 1920 stuff. And then, boom, there'll be a whole section that will seem like the headlines from yesterday. <laughs> so this guy was looking so far ahead and reading the tea leaves for what was coming up that, um, you know, the whole mystical part comes in along with his huge scientific endeavors and, the, you know, the great genius that he was. So along with that, we get this other piece, the mystical piece, where his vision starts to go into tap the Akashic records, where he's seeing the past backgrounds of advanced technology in Atlantis, where he's watching how the mystery schools kept and preserved the traditions over time. And when he looks into this period, he sees the arrival of this Araman figure. And he talks and he sets it up in a sense like this. Well, you know, there was an incarnation of Lucifer in 3000 BC in Asia, and it had an incredible ripple effect. Then there's an incarnation of Christ, and um, everything that happens there provides this whole new impulse for the earth, and, and we get a whole new lease on life, as it were. But now the piece that's coming up is all about facing off against Ahriman. And uh, Ahriman is this major dark astral force that attached itself to the evolution of the Earth. And all of the things that we are to acquire uh, in this kind of scientific face-off with Ahriman is to understand the spiritual nature of science so that there isn't a separation there. But the goal of the Ahrimanic force and the reasons that the mystery schools let so much information out there. So that really, by the time you get into the 20th century, reincarnation, psychic experience, Atlantis, life after death, you know, astral projection, all this stuff is out there in a way that just wasn't there before. Um, they are sort of turning on the gas for this situation and saying, you know, humanity is in such a state that if they're left to these harmonic forces, they won't be recognizable in a century. And so they make this kind of uh, decision, and it's a huge wave. But um, in a nutshell, what we get is they're trying to get enough information out there before World War I. When World War I hits, Steiner considers it a failure of the mystery schools, and he says there's going to be an opportunity. He says this in 1920 at the end of World War I. Um, you know, he says there's going to be an opportunity in about a hundred years. All of this is going to open up again. Anthroposophy, the mystery schools, the whole bit. So he's snapshotting right into this period of time. And yes, there is a prediction associated with, and like the work of Edgar Casey, you know, predictions. There's always a tricky thing with it because um, really only the best can give you predictions that come to pass. But they can give you they can give you the trends of the whole thing. But we have a tendency to just turn somebody into a predictive model. You know, what can they predict? But there are a lot of predictions in Steiner's uh, work, including the fact that America at a certain point is going to outlaw independent thought. Boy, does that sound, does that resonate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, so Steiner, when he's discussing this harmonic force, he decides that, you know, he needs to, get a representation of it. And Steiner's an artist and a sculptor, besides all the incredible other things that he does, multi-talented, prolific. And he kind of engages with this harmonic force to get, get a handle on what it is. And as he does it, he starts to feel like he's almost embedded in concrete or something. This is the feeling of, of Araman. The sculpture, the famous sculpture he comes up with is this one. And um, I think it captures it <laughs> pretty well. But what's remarkable here is this is going to be very important because 
remember the snapshot Armon in your mind, because some of the things that I tell you about Elon and the endeavor around X, the technology involved, the spirit of the whole thing, it's going to be very important because uh, there's a lot of people in situations close to Elon that are raising the specter of Armon uh, by name specifically and getting involved with, uh, you know, I'm going to get to that piece, so I won't spoil it, but wow. Uh, very interesting and offbeat thing shown here on the hand of Armon in the statue. A lot of people try to figure this out. Sometimes it looks like six fingers, but whatever it is, there's some kind of symbolism there that Steiner is leaving behind for us in it. There's a, um, there's a lot of art references around anthroposophy, which is the spiritual science um, foundation that Steiner creates. And the whole piece around art and what can it uh, communicate to the subconscious past the conscious mind is there. So there's a kind of steganography in the art. And um, one of the uh, artists who come to him is, is Hilma Klimt. And he says to her, you know, your art, if you go deep in this fashion, you know, going deep into the spiritual science, your art is going to be an incredible roadmap for people in the future. And um, he tells her, you need to kind of vouchsafe it, keep it almost like a time capsule and have it released maybe in 75 years because the world won't be ready for it yet. And some of that remarkable uh, imagery that shows up in her work just you know at, at a glimpse and in her lifetime she's not very well known but Klimt, she will uh, she's going to get this incredible wave of interest and attention in later life and then long after she's dead actually the first kind of expression of her art happens in the 70s but there's a lot there um and if we go into this piece of art as predictor, of course, there's lots of ex steganography in the medieval paintings um, with Christ, the figure, and that X is, we're going to see it over and over again. I've shown so many examples. This one is particularly interesting. Um, but one of the ones that uh, always grabbed my attention comes from the work of Delschau, a German artist who comes here and becomes part of the Arrow Club. This one is called Trump Arrow, and it's from the 19th century somewhere, and it's got that very strange Trump name and these flying machines. This is important because both Trump and Bobby Kennedy have a deep connection to that aerospace piece. The Kennedys uh, endeavoring to make the secret space program uh, not exist and, you know, to have a public space program and that's it. And the battle over the UFO file being involved in the assassination of president Kennedy, as we put on the record here, and then we move forward and we've got all the information we put on the record about John Trump, uh, who's the scientist uncle of president Trump and his connection to Vannevar Bush who ran the UFO file and Nikola Tesla's papers that he was sent in to find information about taking down flying objects and weapons, advanced weapons, 1943. All that is there as a kind of a tapestry for us to understand this next piece I'm going to discuss. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journal Special Report. This is Here Comes X. And it's a report I wanted to put together for you since Twitter was in the news with the new CEO. And uh, people have got, done a good job of really just lining up her disastrous uh, history. And, you know, I'm not here to throw shade at anyone. <laughs> throw shade. <laughs> the idea of Musk putting in someone from the World Economic Forum, which he called out himself. Actually, I have some of his quotes against them. Why you would ever do that and using the excuse, well, it should be good for advertising. I mean, <laughs> it's such a, an incredible fail, but I'm going to show that Musk is not what he exactly appears to be this becomes very important. Um, and a lot of the left and the right is getting very, very, they're confused at this point. And what's going to help actually is this Manifel to Earth piece I'm going to give us all here. Um, 
Twitter finally agrees on something, on hating Musk's new CEO. After some tumultuous months at the tech giant, NBC Universal Advertising Chief Linda Yaccarina will soon take the reins and no one is happy. Well, there's a reason for that. Um, but the left is actually happy about this one. She was deeply involved with Biden's vaccine promo campaign, all that nonsense. Deeply involved NBC Universal, the social, social justice warrior, and you know that whole woke. You know we'll spend the money with woke money, um, and you know her association is so deep with World Economic Forum that this is not something you could say. Well, she was once affiliated or <laughs> something of this nature. She's deep in there. She's uh, you know one of their main heroes and. She runs a number of their committees and all of these committees are about, you know, how to change the perception, you know, and how to influence uh, people to accept the new reset of these things. And um, what's weird, and it doesn't make any sense, but we're seeing it. I'm getting reports of it all over the place that there's already weird censorship happening on Twitter and people's accounts are already showing up in that old shadow ban status. Now, she hasn't even gone into the job, and I'm not sure we can attribute it to her, but something weird is already going on with Twitter. Um, and the idea uh, that, you know, there was this whole meeting that she had with all these uh, internet advertisers, and he was there, and she was like, will you take a pledge to stop tweeting after 3 a.m.? And, you know, it was like, sorry, mommy, I won't do it anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is, um, there's, there's a weird environment around this whole you know, thing she's a master manipulator that's what yes. this whole thing about advertising right um one of the best series i ever saw it's on youtube for free it's called century of the self it's about the history of oh, yeah. PR propaganda sure edward bernays and all that and this is what it is if she doesn't get the results coming in one way she comes she changes her language a little bit and comes <laughs> exactly. around the other way but she has an agenda she wants to get to a certain place she <laughs> wants right. to sell an idea that's her job. Well, and here's what's interesting too. I can like the whole thing about marketing, whatever, you know, good. If you're good at advertising, it doesn't matter. The problem is fundamentally um, the myth around Musk and why the right embraced him, you know, the Tucker Carlson type people, that whole thing was, you know, just a total myth. And the idea was, oh, he loves, you know, free speech and the constitution as much as we do. And, you know, they had those ridiculous memes of him embracing the Constitution. <laughs> uh, too bad I didn't print that out. <laughs> but um, what's interesting for me is goes beyond the politics of this. And there's plenty there on the political side. Really, what you're getting is the outright um, provocation of saying, you know what? I said I was against World Economic Forum, I said I was against censorship, all this stuff, and here I am installing someone directly from that camp who did that stuff. So, um, it, you know, there's, it's, that's not going to end up <laughs> well, uh, no matter how you, you kind of roll that one out. But it is fascinating because it shows this, you know, kind of wolf in sheep's clothing approach, let's say that. Um, now, what's interesting is, in the same article, this is a Rolling Stone article, it said these same right-wingers are also mad about Yaccarino coming aboard at Twitter. One reason the MAGA crowd disapproves is that she collaborated with the Biden administration on a COVID-19 vaccination campaign and her role as chair of the Ad Council. Vaccine skeptics who rely on Twitter to spread their health misinformation were livid when they learned of her record. Um, so, you know, she's deep in big pharma, she's deep in advertising, she's deep with the Schwab types. It's just, it's a no, you know, there's no winning there. It's, she's a total, one of the worst choices he could have gone for. And yet, remember, he's not really working on Twitter. He's working on X. So she's important for X. And X has to fly through the approval of World Economic Forum and all these other people. We're going to see how that works. So here's the hypocrisy of our friend Musk. Quote, WEF is increasingly becoming an unelected world government that the people never asked for and don't want. So out of that nest of vipers, you grabbed your CEO. That doesn't add up. So um, 
the equation, the piece that he's going for here is this, that Twitter is not going to be Twitter anymore. It's going to be X. Now, remember the X steganography that we've been doing. So it's funny. I said that um, Steiner spent 40 years trying to tell everyone about Armon. <laughs> so I guess in the X series, I spent five years trying to tell you all about the X technology and the X steganography that's attached to it. So we're going to see how all this plays out. Now, back in October of 2022, um, Musk starts to come out and really indicate that ESC is what this is all about, that X is what it's all about, and that um, Twitter is a stepping stone toward this. Buying Twitter is an accelerant to creating X, the everything app. This thing is supposed to do everything for you. <laughs> um, so it's going to run your life, in fact. Now, accelerant is a weird word, and uh, that's the one that sits there in the middle of that tweet. I find the tweet interesting, and um, also the date that it's written, historically, there is, um, you know, it's the date that Sputnik was put up by the Russians, and so it a, has a great um, aerospace connection when he says it. So X is directly connected to that advanced technology. Now, this is a guy who's sending rockets up. He's building electric cars. And with Twitter, he's now formulating that into the social part. So we need to understand those pieces before we put these pieces together, which is all about, now we're going to go back to Steiner and Armon and see how that clicks in. Now, anyone who's aware of Elon and his various relationships will know that he had uh, a deep relationship with Grimes, who's the singer uh, from Canada. And, you know, she's, she's been around a good decade now and um, very creative, very interesting uh, person. <laughs> That's apparently. one way of putting it. <laughs> now Grimes is also his baby mama, as we know. And uh, I've got the exact name of their son, but his you know, the first letter is X and then they AE and this weird code. So he's putting X into his actual child's name. And there, there's a lot of symbolism in the things that he's doing. I'm not going to spend so much time on that. What I want to drill down is on the belief system driving what's going on here and the advanced knowledge of the X steganography, X technology piece. So Grimes now is part of a movie. She did the soundtrack for it and she actually acts in it. It's coming out uh, in the next couple of weeks. This is Grimes, get ready, Armon, Death Before Dying. So um, Grimes now taking this whole Armon piece. I want to go into this a little bit. Here's what I want to say on the record because I've been following Steiner since I was about nine. <laughs> And uh, I can tell you that Armon is just incredibly obscure until it was raised. You know, I mean, it's part of the entire Steiner canon, but they play that down through the Waldorf schools and everything else because they don't want to deal with Armon <laughs> um, or the Eighth Sphere. Now, uh, on this program and subsequently through Gigi Young's work as well, a lot of information came out about Armon and the Eighth Sphere, and it's a whole resurgence around this. So, but I can tell you that Armon is damn obscure. <laughs> and uh, as someone who's been deep in mystical literature all of my life, like it's a very thin corridor of people who even understand it or use the term or whatever. So, uh, this is definitely the period and the wave of when this is happening. And we're right in the middle of it. But now, Grimes and the movie Armon. Uh, Armon, Death and Dying. So this is, there's a lot of little pieces coming out about this. A lot of the imagery around the movie. Uh, again, I'm not questioning her creativity in relation to this. It's totally different. I know I've known musicians my whole life. Of course, I spent a lot of time doing music. Um, I, I understand the nature of uh, that creativity and how people can call it out or misinterpret it. This has nothing to do with that. I, I want to call attention to the fact of her interest in Araman and her connection with Musk being, uh, you know, the mother of his children that close. So uh, let's take a look 
hear more of this imagery again from this movie. Somebody who put this movie together knows damn amount about esoteric themes. And I'm going to put uh, a lot of these up on our Twitter feed as well. This one, uh, this is the actual movie poster, but you can, you get the impression there. There's a lot of AI there. There's a lot of Middle Eastern, some violent themes, maybe some cosmic stuff. And um, there's so many different stills that I have from this movie. One of them, uh, you know, seems to indicate like that knowledge of the two eye stone. Uh, they've got the magic crystal there and all the rest of it. And what's interesting is, um, and maybe when people watch this, they can tell me, but it's my impression that she's pregnant during this filming of this movie because she seems in, in the stills uh, and in the, the previews pregnant. But um, anyway, that connection of Grimes with Armand and then uh, her connection going directly to Musk and then Musk bringing in the X piece puts us right in the heart of the mystery school aspect of this. And in the middle of Steiner's warning about this technology coming in and also the awareness level, which is why the next thing I want to do is read what Steiner is trying to get at. What is it he's trying to call our attention to? Why should we be interested in Armand? And, you know, uh, what level of awareness do we need around this? According to Steiner, it's crucial, absolutely crucial. And when we think about it on this level, you know, when they're putting what they call the richest man in the world with all these technology companies, uh, you know, this type of mentality that the technology is taking over and XAI is here, when we combine the X steganography of the X technology with Musk, and then we bring in the Armand part uh, through Grimes. We're starting to get a picture here that this is something operationally that he's very aware of. And um, I've never felt that, you know, I've always felt that Musk fully understood the implication of the X technology. And he also is very aware of the UFO file and his whole thing about, oh, there are no aliens or whatever is ridiculous. So that's basically the line that they give them at this point, but they're going to change that script. And that's going to be interesting too. everyone. You're watching the dark journalist special report. This is X is here. This is Armon and the UFO file, Elon Musk and the campaign 2024, one huge transparency wave coming in our direction. We're going to take your questions uh, here shortly. And before I go any further, Miss Olivia, you're up. Margot with an XX says, is Grimes a priestess in Elon's religion? And Tessa 1111 says, Hecate is the crossroads, as in the X. Oh, uh, yes. And Baymax says, is there a reason why Elon had an ancient Indian Vajra by his nightstand when he showed us a picture of his nightstand? <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot of esoteric um, understanding on Elon's side. And I think... That might be something where with Grimes that he got, you know, they, they had that in common. But I think that her whole trip is really, you know, the musical creativity thing. And I think what's interesting to me is that, you know, it's pretty obvious if she's doing things related to Araman, it seems to me that Musk is very aware of the Aramonic piece and, you know, participating in it. That becomes important it's hard to judge people's motivations, but when you see them doing erratic moves, like bringing people in from organizations that they, you know, clearly are uh, contrary to the principles that they espouse, then you know there's a lot uh, under behind the scenes that's going on there. The problem is the guy who's supposed to make the aerospace piece so acceptable, you know, that we're going to go to other planets and you know. Grimes was talking about how she wanted to be buried on Mars and things. I was reading her interview, which I have here. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get to that tonight, but it's interesting to me because, you know, there is this central piece about Mars in this religion. And uh, it explains also how behind these forces that are vying for control of the future, the aerospace piece comes up over and over again, because remember the X uh, steganography relates to a technology. 
And uh, so when we talk about it that way and we get into the aerospace piece, and then we remember how we got into aerospace was largely through German rocketry programs um, and what their, what their version, what their view of it was. So when we think about that, you know, we start to put ourselves on the right level of where we can lock into this and say, well, they had intense esoteric occult beliefs. They understood a great deal on the esoteric side. So, um, you know, they completely tried to extract from Blavatsky something that was potent for their own, uh, you know, occult cosmology, but they tested Steiner's work. They burnt down the Gertianum and they just wanted to get, they just regarded him as competition, basically. Yes. Um, Seamus McQuillade says, Grimes seems to evoke Marjorie Cameron, Jack Parsons' Whore of Babylon. Well, it's interesting because um, it's, it's hard to say anything much about their relationship except the fact that they're not together anymore. So, you know, uh, I don't know the extent of her involvement with him on that level, but I will tell you this, that crossover of her getting into the harmonic piece publicly and then uh, him bringing out the X accelerant, <laughs> you know, that, that's the crisscross I think that we're watching here. And I think in relation to the way that they're doing this, the piece that I want to bring back into focus is the UFO file because we don't want to lose sight of how they're doing this. And uh, this is all, there's what I call kind of the false transparency, just like the false embrace of the constitution and all the rest. No, this is definitely um, somebody's laid out a plan of how to do this, and they're using the individuals involved. So you don't even have to take a bad view of somebody like Musk or a bad view of somebody like Grimes. It's more about what are the forces driving them, and what you know. In the case of Elon, what is it that they're doing, putting him in this position of this kind of Howard Hughes Iron Man thing, and then the thing that they're having him deal with is the social media thing. That's public control, control of public perception. And, um, you know, when they have him going in there, it's because they need that control of public perception in order to get the aerospace program to where they want it, because they need the public support for this program, which is going to reveal all the technology that they've hidden away from the public for the past 80 years and probably a lot longer. Um, all right. Steiner. Here's what Steiner says about Aramon. And uh, another quick thing to point out is that, yes, he had mentioned him, but it wasn't until World War I when he decided, oh, you know, things are going to hell. He used to keep the Aramonic information strictly for students and people who would, you know, keep it private. But he let out his own lecture series after World War I, meaning he realized the time had come and Everyone needed to hear about this, not just a select group working on the problem. All right, some impressions that he has here of Armand. In order that Armand's incarnation may take the most profitable form, it is of the utmost interest to Armand that people should perfect themselves in all illusory modern science, but without knowing that it is an illusion. Armand has the greatest possible interest in instructing men in mathematics, but not in instructing them in the mathematical mechanistic concepts of the universe and how they are merely illusions. He's intensely interested in bringing men chemistry, physics, biology, and so on, as they are presented today in all the remarkable effects, but he's interested in making men believe that these are absolute truths, not that they're, they are the only points of view like photographs from one side. If you photograph a tree from one side, it can be a correct photograph, yet it does not give you a picture of the whole tree. If you photograph it from four sides, you can, in any case, get an idea of it. To conceal from mankind that in modern intellectual rationalistic science, 1920, with its supplement of a superstitious empiricism, why we got that with the COVID op, one is dealing with great illusion, a deception that men should not recognize that is of the greatest possible interest to Araman. This then represents one of the means used by Araman to make his incarnation as effective as possible, this keeping of man 
back in scientific superstition. Well, overnight, we saw people clinging to all kinds of false science, and it happens <laughs> on a daily basis. Um, this is a whole harmonic piece to surrender your own reason to this cult of science. You know, people call it the cult over and over again. A little more from Steiner, directly from his writings, because I like to um, encapsulate his what he says, but sometimes the words themselves just really bring it home. The second means that he employs is to stir up all the emotions that split men up into small groups, groups that mutually attack one another. You need only look at all the conflicting parties that exist today. And if you are unprejudiced, you'll recognize that the explanation is not to be found merely in human nature. If men honestly try to explain the so-called world war through human disharmony, they will realize that with what they find in physical humanity, they cannot explain it. It is precisely here that the super sensible powers, harmonic powers, have been at work. These harmonic powers are working, in fact, wherever disharmonies arise between groups of humans. Now the question arises on what foundation is most of what we are considering base? And uh, he goes into a long overview of uh, Armand's history. What I'm going to sum up with this on the Armonic side, Armand also makes use of what develops from the old conditions of heredity, which man really has outgrown in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. That's the modern period that we're in now in, in Steiner's system. He calls this the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. The Armonic powers use all that is derived from old circumstances of humanity, to set men against each other in conflicting groups. All that comes from old differences of family, race, tribes, people is used by Armand to create confusion. These were fine sounding words, freedom for every nation, even the smallest, but the powers hostile to man always use fine words in order to bring confusion and in order to attain the things that Armand wishes to attain for his incarnation, build back better. <laughs> Uh, and so on. It's an incredible lecture series, and it's called The Armonic Deception. Uh, it's, it's unmistakable. That's That, along with a small set of lectures called Lucifer and Armon, give you the real picture of where he's going with it. It's mentioned throughout his work, but he really let the, the kind of bulk of it. So what we're left with is this impression of a force coming in through technology, and um, the warring aspects, and the making people so sure of their scientific outcomes and the cutoff from the spiritualistic aspect so that science becomes the new religion of humanity. This is what Steiner was trying to give us uh, through anthroposophy. The question is, um, you know, it was interesting when I first saw the story about Musk and the CEO and World Economic Forum and all the rest of it, I was tempted to do a very straight ahead report on her background and his motivation. But what I realized was this whole thing that's been playing out, including what we're leading up to with the 2024 election, this is a clash between these harmonic forces and uh, humanity. And you can't miss it. It's unmistakable. And Musk and the whole uh, way that they've connected him in through social media, through space with SpaceX through the X technology and Tesla and everything else by putting him in this all around position with all these companies, he's the person that they think they can introduce it with. Um, and they're the crucial aspect in the middle of it sitting there of the transparency is this piece of the UFO file, which is coming in because that can go for or against them if the false CIA version of disclosure that the government wants out with the UFO threat piece and this, you know, lobbing it on as they did with the uh, UFO defense office to the national defense authorization act, moving it into that war footing and just creating a new enemy. Um, that piece, if that's the piece that we get, then it's going to be really <laughs> hard time. If, however, the transparency piece that we get blows away that CIA thing, hello, Bobby Kennedy blowing away the CIA and exposing the assassinations that took place in his family at the hand of the CIA, you can see how we're looking at two totally different tracks uh, for humanity. 
Now, I have a whole section to read on the UFO file, but because of time, I'm going to jump and we're going to do questions. And in the middle of that, Hmm. I will bounce back and do this little very unusual Betty Hill uh, UFO kind of, I don't even know. It's kind of a revelation sitting in one of the (laughs) books that she wrote kind of offhandedly way, way after her experience with the UFO file and Miss Olivia okay, with that. Okay, I'm going to start You're with up. Mr. Wolf, okay. who says, Elon is a trickster. He will never be someone that can be trusted. Also, Elon, quote, I don't think the government should spy on Americans. Also, Elon, SpaceX will be launching top secret US spy satellites. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this was the interesting thing. He did a whole tweet series about how you could get off the grid and all this stuff. When he knows he's sending up more and more of these Starlink satellites. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of scientific consortiums that, and astronomers and things that have pushed against all of that. And when you think about it, um, for me, you know, the idea of blocking out the stars with these things with the excuse like, oh, someone, you know, at some obscure location can get the internet. You don't need the internet everywhere. <laughs> uh, you don't need that worldwide grid on that level necessarily. And, um, so it's, it's, it's the creation of a massive global control grid. And he's right there sitting in the heart of it. And the thing is, um, with the rhetoric and things that he's used, he's come off and said, well, you know, I believe in freedom and this and that. But at the end of the day, you know, he's, he basically is at the beck and call of the military industrial complex. There's no way of getting around that. So there might be some nice, you know, flourishes on the top <laughs> uh, once in a while. But when you get right down to it, we're looking at the heart of this thing. But if we go deeper and we see the X piece, I wanted to uh, put this on the record, actually, before we jump in with any more. This is important. Um, there's an article that came out in NPR And I was absolutely fascinated by this. Let's see if I can find the thing whole. There it is. Okay. Now, NPR wants to know, why is he obsessed with X? (laughs) Now, you can imagine them. They'd have a heart attack if if they knew that they could call me up and get the answer. That would Hmm. be a problem. All right. A brief biography of X, the letter that Elon Musk has plastered everywhere. This is an article from yesterday on NPR. They want to know why is he using X? Like, what's what's the deal? They go through all of his biographies, all of his friends, all of his notes, and everything. They can't find any reason for him using it. I'll give you a good reason, but let's listen to what they came up with. Um, so they're saying, well, he wrote, "Looking forward to working with Linda to transform this platform into X, the Everything app." He wrote on Friday. Musk has teased the announcement a day earlier, tweeting, "I've hired a new CEO for X." She will be starting in six weeks. Musk has tacked the letter X onto his business ventures and more, but the billionaire hasn't given much much explanation for what it means. X, Musk Musk tweeted in April. That's it, just the letter X. (laughs) Days earlier, a filing in federal court confirmed Twitter had been folded into X Corp. According to biographers, the letter X frames Musk's ambitions where Musk's ambitions are headed while paying homage to Musk's entrepreneurial start. XCOM, the bank where it became, uh, where it began, (laughs) where it began. According to Ashley Vance, the author of Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future, that's a long title, Musk's obsession with the letter X began with one of the billionaire's earliest ventures, X.com, which later merged with a competitor to become PayPal. Everyone tried to talk him out of naming the company that back then because of the sexual innuendos, but he really liked it and stuck with it. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Um, Then they go into uh, his children being named X, and then uh, X is the first letter of his youngest son's name. In 2020, Musk and his then-partner Grimes welcomed his son via surrogate, naming him X-A-E, which, by the way, was the name of the famous theosophical artist a-12 musk then they're like ae is pronounced ash musk told controversial podcast host joe rogan yeah you have to say controversial (laughs) um so and then they show that 
strange string that Musk puts up for the name. But anyway, X in the heart of it. Um, now, there's a piece in here where they're just kicking around and they keep going through X the Everything app. Like, well, now what is he using X for? But lately, X has referred to Musk's newest ambition, building an everything app akin to China's popular WeChat. Yeah, it's popular. If, you, uh, if your social credit score gets low, you might end up in jail. And they had this one thing where this one guy had you know, gone afoul of these social media roles and they were literally had this guy and they were sitting there yelling at him. It was like, you know, this scream session. So uh, it's not popular with people who love freedom. It's popular with authoritarian uh, tyrants. They're saying it's a popular WeChat in China. It doesn't yet have a U.S. parallel. <laughs> Don't worry, they're working on it. He wants to create an app similar to how WeChat is used in China, where it's part of the fabric of day-to-day -day life. <laughs> you can use it to communicate, to consume news, to buy things, to pay your rent, to book appointments with your doctor, or even pay fines. Yeah, <laughs> said Vance. Um, so, you know, and we know, we've heard that he wants to make it like that. But of course, this whole idea of how they do things in China versus how they do things, should do things here by the Constitution, world's different. And it's, it's a very kind of dark uh, use that they have it there. If you step out of line politically, you're finished. You might even disappear. Vance says, following the WeChat model makes sense with what Musk wants for Twitter. The company clearly needs a new, bigger business if it's to make the type of money that would justify his investment to satisfy his ambition. Boy, these are some flimsy. Uh, it's like it's not even examining this two inches thick. Weeks before he shelled out $44 billion to acquire Twitter, Musk tweeted, buying Twitter as an accelerant to creating X, the everything app. And then at the end of the article, they go X dot, 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 question mark. And that's very interesting. But Musk's obsession with the letter S is still something of a mystery, even to his biographers, like his main biographer, this guy named Higgins. Whether it's kind of mysterious or something pulled from a comic book, it's hard to know with him. Gee. <laughs> uh, so it's fascinating. When we think about X steganography and we think about the, you know, the whole gigantic piece we've laid out here, uh, these guys obviously would get a lot from the X Degonography series, understanding X and how it fits in with what Elon is doing and how the X technology sits there in the UFO file would open that whole piece up. Yes, Miss Olivia. Karen Carpenter, the eighth sphere is being constructed with Meta and Twitter X. Uh, yeah, well, I think the, um, when I think about the eighth sphere, it literally is, you know, kind of like the most evil version of virtual reality. You can think of it that way. So the idea is to get you into a, a false reality. Mm. So I think of um, some of the pieces that uh, Musk has been talking about that have to do with neural implants and things like that. That reminds me more of the eighth sphere um, the because it's a place to take your consciousness into. Now, it's interesting because Steiner said that the eighth sphere was one of the biggest secrets that the mystery schools held. And um, that it got out accidentally and was wrongly attributed in the kind of cosmology to the moon, which is, you know, it's a long story, but um, that's a false uh, idea of it. The eighth sphere isn't something that's tangible physically. It's built as a kind of a thought realm. And the idea of moving and creating that eighth sphere through the technology, it's actually about bringing the eighth sphere, which already exists, into the technology. So a lot of things that we have uh, about virtual reality, AI, things of this nature, if you bring them in understanding the dangers uh, on that spiritual evolutionary track of the eighth sphere, because here's the Steiner cosmology. In humanity, you know, we go through a certain system of development. And the, the thing that happens when you leave the earth as you go through the different planetary cycles. Now, in this case, what happens is the harmonic force trains or captures the attention and the mind of a person, and they get sucked into this other realm, which is not uh, you know, the traditional spiritual evolutionary path. It's this other thing. And then they get locked into that evolutionary track, and they actually reincarnate on earth after having not gone through this cycle. 
So it interrupts the entire evolutionary track of humanity on a spiritual evolutionary level. And it brings in this other thing, this kind of warped um, capture of souls and entities. So um, the eighth sphere in short is a, you know, it's a false uh, reality. And it, you find yourself living in that reality and it's controlled. And the idea is instead of letting these beings evolve beyond earth and all the rest, you keep them in this earthly loop with Araman as the master, constantly giving them different illusions until finally they disappear. That's the cosmology that Steiner's giving us from anthroposophy a hundred years ago about this. And uh, how much it resonates now with the things that we're seeing in the movements through technology. Again, um, the idea in the Steiner work is to face Araman and to gather knowledge from that scientific battle, as it were, and not to back off and say, oh, I'm not going to deal with technology ever again. I'll go live on a mountain. <laughs> uh, mountains are fine, but there's no reason to kind of re refrain from the battle, as it were. Yes. Uh, Boober fighter, I consider Starlink as camouflage for UFOs, and yeah, we burn stuff. How has Araman an impact on the UFO files? Well, there's a lot in that because um, knowledge that's hidden from humanity, you know, if it comes into their kind of sleepy consciousness, as it were, um, they have tremendous power if it comes in that way. If we're aware of Araman, if we're aware of what's behind the UFO file, if we're aware of our own history, our Atlantis history, um, then the whole dynamic changes. You're no longer an energetic pawn in this kind of gigantic, you know, galactic game. <laughs> um, so the idea is to gain the awareness. And the thing is those schools that have left footprints for us for different things, they've left the track out there. You know, um, people have found through their own spiritual experience answer for things, awareness for things. So they don't fall into these traps, but uh, humanity is vast. And, you know, the idea generally is that humanity is falling further and further into this drowsy spell. And then the harmonic forces come in through the technology and just grab a hold. Now we've already seen people, I've seen people get addicted to things like video games, you know, and we read about porn studies, people getting addicted to porn or gambling online. And to such a point with gambling online that, you know, they're wrecking their life savings and everything like that. And in the middle of that, we hear about entrainment technology, which is a subliminal technology to make you do a particular thing, whether you want to do it or not, by unconsciously suggesting it to your subconscious mind. Um, those types of things, having awareness around those types of things, give us a total different, much more level playing field. So when you get around the UFO file, if you understand X technology, if you understand the role that um, the aerospace companies play around the UFO piece, then, uh, and also if you understand the, there's an occult nature to the UFO file, then you're dealing on a totally different awareness level. If you get there, things start to change. I remember this incredible quote from uh, Ospensky, and, uh, you know, Russian philosopher, he was talking, he was getting these questions and they said, what's the point? You know, if humanity is just going to have all these world wars, they were in the middle of world war two at that point, you know, they were like, what's the point if for us to raise our awareness, if these maniacs around us are going into world war. And he said, well, when you raise your own awareness, your own consciousness level, the conditions outside of you change. So, when we think of it like that, the actual reality that you exist in when your awareness is raised is different. So that that gets us into a, whole yeah, lot, a much is, a different we're level. We're talking about co-creation yes. right, of the matrix or the simulation that everybody seems to be talking about these days. This is the big realization that's happening I think, I think on that, YouTube and yeah. kind of 
um, esoteric channels is this coming at it, describing it a little differently, but basically that we're in a, a holographic universe, we're in a simulation, and we have a certain amount of agency there um, to co-create it. And But the first thing you have to do, and this is why meditation is so important, is retreat from identification with it so you can be observe it objectively. That's an excellent point. I think the word matrix there is particularly important because that's what's being set up. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, hang on one second. Okay, sacred forest. But DJ, won't the uh, won't the rollout of all that X tech require absolute control over the populace first? Neuralink, digital ID, CBDC, X app, etc. Yeah, they're ready with it. I mean, they've you know we've been hearing all these reports. They've already agreed. A number of nations have already agreed to roll things out like central control, digital ID, and CBDC. they wouldn't do that unless they had it already. That's true. The um, at the same time. You know, they could run into an earthquake like Bobby Kennedy's candidacy. That may not have been anticipated. Um, they may have thought they knew what they were up against. So um, there are things going on in the world in the mix of this. While they're creating a false UFO threat, something genuine <laughs> may be going on, um, which is also out of their control. Uh, there may be a collapse internally just from the level of corruption taking place. So, um, you know, there are a number of, of factors which don't make it just an easy slam dunk for them to have all this. However, we should anticipate that they have all that stuff ready. By the way, when they talk about the dangers of AI, they're 40 years ahead of us with AI than anything that they talk about. So whatever they're talking about, <laughs> was a discussion that they could have had in 1982. So, uh, you know, yes, I mean, things get let out to the public and they get to discuss them there, but on the inside, they've talked about them. They already know about it. Just like on the UFO file side, I want to say this though, the, the whole thing we get into on this program about apothium and in short, apothium is this kind of breakaway physics it's this reality distortion field that comes about from working with that X technology. And it also comes about from working with the UFO file. So, you know, all those things that we hear about the very unusual circumstances, you know, people going through walls and abduction experiences and all this, the separation of traditional physics from the reality that all comes out of this apothium level. And the, the problem with apothium type technology and the effect uh, from the UFO X technology of apothium is that they can't control it. So what you get very often is um, it's not easy to aim <laughs> and um, you know, so they've gotten very far with it, but they, they still have incredible unknowns in relation to the UFO file. So although they have this incredible knowledge base, they're, they're facing a level of unknowns, and that's why you get this incredible frenzied X-Protect action around the UFO file. It's not because, oh, hey, we're hiding aliens. Yeah, they would keep that at an incredibly secret level, true. But as we know, uh, because we had the physicist Sarbarker put it on the record, who was working with the UFO file, he said, oh, yeah, Vannevar Bush was in charge of the UFO file, and, you know, we went through and we classified the UFO file at a higher level of secrecy than the atomic bomb. So you understand the level of secrecy they keep it at. So, you know, that whole field and all those people around the UFO thing have been so dumbed down um, that they'll basically take any answer, which is why all this CIA junk is coming out. And by the way, the CIA has a number of movies books, <clears throat> new figures you've never met, n new narratives around the UFO thing, false, you know, they're going to let out some false stuff through Arrow, the UFO Defense Office, UFO Doe. So, you know, they're ready, just like the whole thing. You, you were mentioning they're lining up CBDCs and all that. I'm glad the alternative media is on to that. <laughs> but we need to get more on to the UFO threat piece because it's, there's only a few people who understand it. Um, Aorki 01, maybe AI already rules the world. It would explain the non-human type decisions going on from world leaders. I absolutely <laughs> believe that. 
Well, they could be, it could be a factor. It could be a factor. They could be going to the AI. It might be why you're getting such completely upside down versions of things. For example, when they ran the COVID off, they had to know at a certain point the game would be up <laughs> because enough scientists and doctors would snuff out the situation. Um, so, you know, this is very interesting. They're kind of moving from emergency power to emergency power. So they've just moved from the emergency medical power. What's the next thing? Well, it's probably the cyber threat, you know, um, and cyber attack thing. Oh, everything's out. You know, we're going to have to switch to a digital currency for that reason. Um, and building up in the background is a, the UFO threat. And it's something that's connected directly with the continuity of government program. In fact, the person you see that comes out when we have these things happening um, is, as I've pointed out before, not Stafford Biden. It's the Northcom commander, Van Hark. He comes out whenever we have a problem. And it's funny because from time to time, people will write me and say, well, you know, they didn't, uh, they didn't try to hype the balloon thing when that was happening, you know, and they did. I don't know. <laughs> it's like you're looking at a different set of news. And um, the balloon thing was hyped to, you know, first of all, you would never let a balloon sail across. They just let another one across from Hawaii two weeks ago. Um, but you'd never let a balloon go across the continental United States. It would never happen because we have rules against that since the world wars. It's the most ridiculous, weird thing. But um, just as kind of to put this on the record, this is the New York Times when they were doing the balloon waves and they did the phony shoot downs and wouldn't show us any of the debris. Here's how the New York Times put it. U.S. destroys UFOs. <laughs> That's their headline. All right. So, yeah, they did hype it. They were talking about destroying UFOs. Uh, so, you know, we need to catch up to their game because I have smart people tell me, oh, they couldn't do a UFO threat. I have UFO researchers who say, oh, they'd never try that. I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> What's the disconnect? First of all, they have all of the um, incredible background on this. They've been working on it for 80 years, as we know that. People inside the government have come out and told us about it, okay? They have massive space infrastructure to do this, and they have massive hologram, uh, you know, voice to skull. They have everything that they need to do a alien invasion op. There's no question about it. The UFO threat op is pretty easy to do. So they could, they could stage it. And if they needed to back off of the alien part, they could always say, Oh, it was, you know, some mystery or whatever. But, um, you know, for sure, probably, you know, the UFO threat, I think is, is the thing that gives them the absolute emergency powers across the board you know, their options, cyber attack, social unrest, nuclear exchanges are all a lot messier, <laughs> believe it or not. So when you see all these things come out about UFO threats, UFO threats, and they attach it to the National Defense Authorization Act, that's the sign of what you're working with. Yes. Chris Lothian, uh, I saw a pretty good interview with RFK Jr. and Russell Brand yesterday in which RFK mentioned Howard Hunt's deathbed confessions. Uh, how much of the UFO story do you think he knows? <laughs> Um, I don't think that, um, see, I've, I've put a few things on the record about the 2024 election. One of the things I've said is whoever jumps on that UFO threat story and the UFO transparency story is going to be ahead of the ball game. They're already rolling us out. Look, this was the balloon that they had. That's 10 days ago over Hawaii, right? They're, they're keeping, they're doing the data mining on this stuff. They're working on it. They're still working it out. If you get ahead of it, they're going to roll things out. So whoever has that as part of their agenda, transparency on that topic, is actually going to be, you're going to be communicating with a lot of different people on that. Now, um, you know, since they try to peg RFK Jr. with all these things like, uh, you know, oh, he's a uh, <clears throat> vaccine quack and all this stuff, you know, just because he wants the real truth and wrote a book about Fauci, you know, examining his criminal background. Um, then, you know, you can see that there's a lot of things that RFK Jr. knows and that he's putting up there already, including the CIA assassination of his uncle and his dad. That's incredible uh, transparency level. 
Uh, and so, you know, it would be hard to just roll the UFO part in on top of that. But the fact is, whoever does it, whoever has the edge on that front is going to be doing very well in 2024 because it's going to be a huge topic next year. And uh, I would suggest that they do have a very solid transparency position, but all of his positions are transparent. That's, that's what the guy is all about. So he's really the transparency candidate and he's having the effect. If you really watch him in action that Trump had in 2016, which is he's upsetting the apple cart <laughs> so that nobody knows where this thing is going. That's what you want uh, in government. You want the total uh, yeah, the, the disruption. government needs to be returned to the people. The people, that's the problem is the for, of, and by the people is, has been shot to hell, oh, yes. you know, slowly eroded to the point where we all sort of woke up and what, what the hell happened. Um, the incompletest is asking, how does DJ see the X protect slash X share paradigm playing out today? Uh, RFK, Trump, uh, how do they play into this dynamic? Yeah, uh, well, RFK and Trump are both, uh, you know, I'd line them more up both of them with the ex share aspects in government. Um, Bobby Kennedy's uncle, John Kennedy was totally, he was trying to bring the UFO file, working it behind the scenes with the Russians. He was trying to share our two UFO files. Um, there's a piece there about the secret space program that I've discovered that I let out and I'm going to do a whole uh, weekend show on it for Memorial day weekend. It's a two parter. It's all about blue, which is the secret space program. That's the code steganography that they used for it. There's going to be a lot in there that covers um, the X share X protect groups, but you're going to see that Kennedy TT Brown, a series of people in government were deeply committed uh, to transparency on the UFO file front. I have a letter that I, I put out in an episode two weeks ago, which is John F. Kennedy. It's a response to John F. Kennedy's letter to the Air Force demanding that they come clean on UFOs. That's 1958 as a senator. So John Kennedy was way, you know, before his presidency, was way ahead on this whole issue. And we know that his mentor and friend, James Forrestal, was killed over the UFO file. So he understood it incredibly well. Um, the thing about X Protect is it's bigger than ever and it's more public than ever, which <laughs> this is the shocking part to me that the CIA nowadays doesn't work uh, through flunkies as much anymore. They come out and they're just like, hey, we're a bunch of CIA agents. We have a company and we're abductees. <laughs> we're going to take over the UFO file. This is really interesting. Um, but, you know, I under ordinary circumstances, that would be jaw dropping, right? They're like, well, you know, I'm a CIA agent for 25 years and I was getting abducted that whole period of time. And now I'm ready to tell my story. <laughs> uh, forgive me if I, you know, you're not the first person I would go to for transparency about the UFO file, seeing as you're a CIA agent. Um, so we have a lot there to work with. Very interestingly, Bobby Kennedy has said that um, he would break up the CIA into different departments to make them transparent. This is a huge earthquake uh, if it were to happen and the whole world, not just the country, would operate differently if that were true. So this is really powerful positions that RFK Jr. is laying out there. Yes. Great story. Do you remember when John Warner referred to Elon Musk as a quote, CIA lapdog, unquote, <laughs> on your show? Let me tell you about Warner. Warner, his dad was an MJ-12. Okay. His dad was the head of the Navy. His dad was a Senator from Virginia. Uh, you know, you get a lot in there. His mom was the Mellon heir to the Mellon fortune. I mean, that's a lot of information. So the guy knows a lot when he talks, <laughs> I listen closely and, uh, it's good. He has a sense of humor as well, but I think in relation uh, to Musk, you know, a lot of people understand this about Musk people who go deep on it. Um, they're always seeing the DARPA connections. Look, you can't do anything in space without the government holding you hostage, basically. You're not going to be able to do it. So um, that's the way that it works. They've been developing the infrastructure in space since 19, since the original moon launch. And uh, 72 is the last time we went to the moon. Well, that's 50 years ago. So they didn't do any manned missions. Again, it's ridiculous. What did they do in the meantime? 
while they were building something, they built some kind of infrastructure there. And um, that's where we get into the whole idea of Blue, the SSP, the secret space program. Um, these things are core because right now they're behind a wall of secrecy. And the reason that the average public gets the schizophrenic, you know, we have all this stuff going on <laughs> about, um, you know, a six-year-old having trans rights or something like, you know, it, it'll keep you spinning. It'll keep you arguing and fighting in the wrong directions while they're moving forward with this. And we've seen that a lot of their plans don't include us. <laughs> yes. 1968 Camaro's SS question. How do we identify those that are in control and manipulating us? Scarlet Fire answers that question by quoting James Madison, quote, the truth is that all men having power ought to be mistrusted, unquote. Oh, wow. That's really true. Well, they should be held to a high standard of transparency, you know, and that's absolutely crucial. The other thing that's important to remember about all this is that as long as they adhere to the Constitution, that, you know, that's how it's laid out. So we're a nation of laws. The laws are there for a reason. They come about through thousands of years of human experience. And the founding fathers got a set together that made America, you know, the light of the world until those things got abused. So, um, you know, it's all a work in progress, of course. But if you go back to the Constitution, that's fundamentally how you're going to be able to tell. Who is it that wants to remove this or that from the Constitution? Well, that's a problem. <laughs> so uh, that's a pretty easy way, uh, especially in politics, to get a handle on it. The first thing that you have to remember is any excuse to get rid of speech is ultimately the dead giveaway that you're dealing with a totalitarian, authoritarian. And they might have the best excuse. They might say, oh, we'll have less children killed with guns if you get rid of free speech. doesn't matter what they would use, you know. Uh, so we have to pay very close attention when they roll out initiatives of that nature. And uh, they have so many from domestic terrorism to the Espionage Act, you know, anything to prevent you from saying the truth. One of the conversations that they fear the most is exactly what we see taking place right now here in the ideas room. This is the thing that they fear the most. That's why during the COVID thing, it's, you know, six feet in a mask. And in Australia it was, Hey, don't look at people in the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Cause you might get together and say, oh, don't you think this government is corrupt and full of it? Yeah. Oh, let's get together and form a protest. You know, this is uh, centralization of totalitarian control. So, we have the power to set that back. That's the name of the game. That is the mission. And the, there's no better opportunity than the setup this year for the 2024 election. Yes. Uh, Let's say two more questions. Okay. Well, you've got to get to the um, I'll Betty, read, Betty I'll read Barton that. Hill thing, right? I'll read that little section. Yeah. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, Teresa Blackburn, DJ, what's your thoughts on Greer's presser on the COG and UFO <laughs> disclosure in DC next month? Yeah, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be another event like that. Um, You're not terribly hopeful? <laughs> no, I mean, I, uh, look, the uh, the people who <laughs> I can't stand in the UFO field are people like Elizondo and, you know, the people who are pretending and pushing this false UFO threat. Other people, whether you agree with them or not, you know, um, who are doing work to, trying to get answers and things like that. Uh, I'm always, you know, in favor of those things. And um, generally I wish them the best. My feeling is that the, the field has been flooded with a lot of uh, tons of CIA misinformation, but actual agents and the amount of money that's been used um, by Christopher, you know, Christopher Mellon, Lou Elizondo, Jim Semivan, that whole, uh, kangaroo circus of UFO disclosure. That's the stuff that um, is working on the UFO threat emergency powers piece. They've tried to co-opt it. They've tried to massage it. They've tried to change the label when we expose them, actually. So here at our outpost, you know, 
uh, we put the whole UFO threat thing on trial and it ricocheted out around the UFO community to such a point that they started to say, well, you know, uh, whoever doesn't get on with this UFO threat is, uh, you know, they're going to be made to look foolish. I remember those things. I remember the phone calls from the pretentious people in the field telling me I better get on board. Oh, I'd never be on board with anything like that. Are you crazy? So, um, you know, for me, the field, the, the traditional UFO field collapsed around the weight of TTSA and things like that coming up with documentaries and way to, you know, be like, hey, you're going to be part of this TV series. <laughs> and a lot of these people went for it and they treated Elizondo, even though he was a proven liar, um, they treated him like he ran the program that he ran and that he wasn't, but you know, he was saying, Oh, I came out of the government. I left the government and, um, I'm fighting that government for you guys. But while he was working for the government and he never has to explain because the people that he talks to won't ever ask him any tough questions. So, um, you know, those, that's a whole gang of liars around the UFO file, but, uh, in terms of the Greer thing, no, I'm, I mean, I'd be curious to see what they come up with. Yes. Were you going to read that thing? Uh, why don't you give me the next question <laughs> and then I'll read this. I don't have a question. Oh, excellent. For you. All right. Even better. But actually, I have a weird question. I don't know what to <laughs> make of this. Ray Story, what do you think of Elon Musk buying Coca-Cola Bottling Incorporated? I did not know about this. Oh, I <laughs> I have to look into that. But wow. if that's true, huh. I mean, conspiracies galore yeah, that's... on that one. <laughs> we'll have to take a real look at that one. I found a mention of Arman in Blavatsky's works, uh, and she actually has a whole, like it's a small book, but there's a book called Thoughts on Ormuz and Arman. So she had been looking at it and snapshotting that somewhere along the line. Steiner decided, you know, I'm, I'm tying into that. And that's where he got into it. But it is Blavatsky who mentions it first. And it's interesting. I'm just going to read briefly something she said, and then I'll get to Betty Hill. No more philosophically profound, nor grander, nor more graphic and suggestive type exists among the allegories of world religions than that of the two brother powers of the Mazdian religion called Ahura Mazda and Angra Mainyo better known in their modernized forms as Ormuz and Araman. Of these two emanations, sons of boundless time itself issued from the supreme and unknowable principle, the one is the embodiment of good thought, the other is of evil thought, or Akko Mano. The king of light, or Ahura Mazda, emanates from the primordial light and forms or creates by means of the word. However, uh, Ahuna Varya, a pure and holy world. Um, oh, Honover, I'm sorry, H-O-N-O-V-E-R. That's where the word comes from, Honover, a pure and holy world. But Angra Manyo, Araman, though born as pure as his elder brother, became jealous of him and mars everything in the universe as on the earth creating evil wherever he goes. The two powers are inseparable on our present plane and at this stage of evolution and would be meaningless one without the other. They are therefore two opposite poles, of one manifested creative power, whether the latter is viewed as a universal cosmic force which builds worlds or under its anthropomorphic aspect than when its vehicle is thinking man for Ormuz and Arman are the respective representatives of good and evil, of light and darkness. So there is Bovatsky laying out a little, little bit of that, and there's that medieval presentation. The first set of tarot cards of the Eighth Sphere. Very interesting. Um, now, one last piece on the UFO file it has to do with Betty Hill and her descriptions of the U.S. military working with aliens and UFOs. Now, a lot of people think she had this experience <laughs> and um, she got abducted. She talked about it and her and 
her husband, Barney, who were an interracial couple in New Hampshire, in 1961, got abducted. And then the story came out and that that was it. Well, Barney died just a few years later, but Betty Hill went on for years having experiences with aliens. So that's the unusual thing. She wrote a book back there about her experiences. Just a couple of quick notes to kind of sum up what we've been talking about on the UFO file side. Um, so we have the character that she called Junior. And this was the being that she encountered when she was abducted. Now, interestingly enough, when they showed her pictures of greys and stuff later, she said, oh, you know, the being I met with was basically like a person. It wasn't a grey. The gray, she was, They were like, what about the big grey eyes? They're like, no, it, it's true. You know, it didn't really, the nose was different and the head shape was large, but it didn't have the traditional gray eyes, you know, the black eyes and all the rest of it. So whoever she met was different. <laughs> um, the other picture of who she termed the leader, it's almost, it's almost menacing kind of picture. But uh, again, it's not really like a gray. It's actually different. What do you think of that? It's pretty men menacing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to meet him in that so way. when we think about, and this is that UFO picture, of course, from Scotland that was hidden for 30 years. It was taken in 1990. Um, so when we keep in mind the things that Betty Hill saw and experienced during her abduction experience, now listen to a very unusual little passage in her book, UFO Abduction Aftermath, A Common Sense Approach to UFOs by Betty Hill. Um in the spring of 1966, I was at the grocery store when a friend asked me, she lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is how far away would you say that is an hour? Yeah, probably about an hour. Very nice up there. Uh, in the spring of 1966, I was at the grocery store when a friend asked me if I'd been to Elliot to watch the UFOs every night. They were coming up with the cat <laughs> Piscataqua. Is that it? Piscataqua. Yes. River. <laughs> I at think does. It's, isn't it Piscataqua? Piscataqua. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Piscataqua River at dusk. Everyone was going there to watch them. She gave me the best routes to fall for the best observations. That night, my sister and I went to Elliot across the bridge from Portsmouth. We were not alone. Her cars were bumper to bumper traveling around five miles per hour. 1966. Cameras were set up and searchlights placed in the fields. People ran between slow-moving cars. Vendors sold their wares. And strangers spoke to strangers. No masks. <laughs> there was great excitement everywhere, a wonderful holiday mood. I decided to take a small side road to get out of the traffic for a few moments. This road ran parallel to the river there. Sitting on the banks of the river was a UFO just above the water. It was not moving. This was a disc with small multicolored lights circling around the edges of it. I said, hi there. <laughs> the front of the disc dipped down slightly, and then it began slowly moving across the river. The sky was spectacular. The UFOs were coming up the river in single file. When they reached the area of Pease Air Force Base, they became airborne. UFOs, military planes, private planes, helicopters were all flying around in the same general area. When it appeared that they might be very close to each other, we all feared they might crash. We could hear a loud moan coming from all the cars. This pattern continued for weeks. Sometimes the UFOs came up the river in groups of four, other times single file. People came from long distances to watch this air show. Locally, Night entertainment was at a very low ebb because everyone was watching the free show at Elliot. Now, what I want to point out there is, um, one, all these UFOs around water, again, around a river. Two, they're all seeing the UFOs out there with helicopters, private planes, and everything else. Everybody knows everybody else. <laughs> So whoever's operating those things is in some kind of an understanding with the Air Force base there. The other thing that's possible that we could be looking at is there's been crashes of these disks. They've redeveloped them and they're flying them around and they're putting them on these little trial runs, seeing if their pilots can control these things. 
Whatever it is, it's a fascinating slice of history, which is totally different from her abduction experience, but is, you know, straight out of her diary. And it gives us an idea that the UFO file, not only have they been working with these groups, whatever they are, and that technology for decades, um, but that, you know, people have lived and died with this knowledge and information. So the idea that we're coming up in 2023 here, 2024, next year, to this transparency around uh, UFOs, it's like something they've already played out on multiple angles. They already have disclosure inside the government around this. The question is, what kind of a phony UFO threat are they going to give us? And with that, Miss Olivia, you're up. You know, I was just thinking about Betty Hill. I don't know why it it hadn't occurred to me before, but because she had already overcome any kind of aversion, you know, marrying someone of another race, I think helped to set her up back for, then, back oh, then my God, actually yeah. to perceive the aliens in a friendlier light, if you know what I mean. So she, she was able to look past people's appearances into their essence, Interesting. you know, so she was more advanced, I think more evolved than a lot of people. I remember. Absolutely. You know, I saw her in a number of interviews and I've talked to relatives of her family and, um, you know, it's interesting because they showed her pictures of the grays and stuff in the 1980s. And she was like, no, come on. You know, the thing that abducted me was a per, it was a person. It was, you know, they looked different, but they were people, <laughs> You know, so she regarded them as space people, but they were people. Whereas the grays, you know, she was like, it didn't look anything like that. So that tells us that something else is going on there beyond the regular abduction uh, experience, shall we say. And we'll leave that there. And Miss Olivia, your super chatters are- Okay, actually, let me just end on this note. Yes. Okay. So Simone Nyman wants to know, is Musk following a left or right hand path? And do you think that he wants to be the first Earth space president? Well, I came up with this concept that they were sort of laying out during the Ukraine war, the space president idea with him, because he was saying, hey, I'm going to supply uh, Ukraine with all these satellites. Now, that's, you know, he's a corporation, <laughs> right? He's the CEO of a corporation. You're not supposed to interfere in wartime in that fashion. So they were giving him this idea of space president, but you know, we don't have any setup for a space president election. There's no process there. And um, so for me, that's just more assumed authority, which doesn't exist. And whether he's left hand or right hand, look, you know, those are the choices that somebody makes oh, when they wake up every day. And uh, what I can say is it's become pretty obvious that a lot of what they were laying out there with Musk as this, you know, <clears throat> sort of superhero guy who has come to save the day, you know, with his choice of the CEO really looks like it was just a made up story, a myth. So a bunch of conservatives would get on board uh, with what he was doing there with Twitter. And uh, I expect that he is designed to roll out the AI and the advanced technology. He's one of the figures that they've put right in the heart of it. And um, so therefore, you know, for me, uh, I don't trust anything that Musk says, literally. So, <laughs> but yeah, that doesn't make him right or left. It just, you know, I'm not going to trust him uh, on that level. Not because I'm not a trustworthy person, but because of the nature of the people controlling well, the what more he the, is. The more you, know? you learn, the more suspicious you become, the more paranoid you become. <laughs> and um, what was that line from... The X Files about not being no matter what you're not paranoid enough, right? <laughs> so well, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's really not. true, but it is true also that um, we can also look a gift horse in the mouth. Like I think a lot of people with Bobby Kennedy's candidacy, they're like, you know, oh, you know, we can't solve things for the presidential election. I can't tell you how ridiculous that is. And the idea is like, oh, no, we're just going to work on city councilors and forget about the presidential level. That's fine. Those things make a difference. But the body politic has a head and the head is the president. And you need the presidency in the hands of someone who respects the Constitution. You can't have Biden in charge 
you know, of the X technology and all the rest of it, uh, especially with their dreams and their goals at that level of consolidation of the 7 billion people on earth. Um, you know, we've seen that they abuse that power dramatically. So if you get an opportunity to have someone in there who control the border, who will respect the constitution and restore transparency and get rid of the pharmaceutical, um, you know, <laughs> cartel, then, you know, that's worthwhile and it's worth taking the time and the energy and even removing some of the cynicism for. So I, I honestly believe that, uh, you know, as much as it's, it's good not to trust anything on that level. Um, when we get an opportunity, you know, we don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth and with the candidacy with 2024, with two forces that strong coming in, you know, Trump on his side and RFK Jr. on his side, smashing the Biden regime in the middle is crucial. And for all of humanity, we need to do that. I can tell you that. And with that, Miss okay. Olivia, you're All up. right. Um, Empire of the Light, Don Newey, Marvin Remeyer, The Weed in Your Garden, Terry Doherty, Jetlag 747400, Blake Toves, um, Xavier Figueroa, uh, Eurythmius Fun, Robert Scott, W.C. Ray, Slow Time, Warlock, Tish M., a cult fan, Eorky, O1, uh, Karen Carpenter, The Buddhas of Boston Sports, Margo with an XX, and the Philip K. Dick Film Festival. I'm sorry if I forgot anybody. I think I did. I'm so, I apologize. Incredible. Wow. We really appreciate your support. I saw some comments out there. Uh, there was some UFO footage that was supposed to come out. And then some guy, you know, decided not to do it. So some other guy went over to his house and pirated it, <laughs> the whole thing through a spy cam on his pen or something. I, you know, so here's my, I have a very easy, easy formula around UFO footage. If you have it, release it. Right. Uh, but, and then on the other hand, you know, don't go in somebody's house and spy <laughs> on their videotapes, you know, that's part of the weird game and God knows the stuff that you'd get, you know, where somebody could say, Oh, it was half baked footage. I didn't know what it was, but um, that kind of stuff doesn't really live up to a, a professional <laughs> environment. You know, if somebody says, Oh, you know, like I saw Elizondo saying, Oh, I, I, you know, I've been in possession of a 47 minute video of a pyramid UFO. Oh yeah, Lou. Well, put it out then. <laughs> All right. If you have a 47 minute of a period UFO that you've seen, put it out, you know? So, um, you know, and get real too, that the people that you're talking to realize that in the public, you're a liar, you know, you've lied multiple times. So <laughs> some of us are very aware of the nature of, of those lies. But when it comes to this thing, uh, and it, it came out through an interesting thing, which is the guy supposedly had the footage. And uh, I think it was... Someone went on Joe Rogan and was talking about it. Said, "Oh yeah, he has this videotape. You know, talking talk is cheap. If you've got UFO footage, put it out. There's tons of UFO footage out. If it's that good, then let's look at it. <laughs> um, and I highly recommend that people do that. And don't worry about you know financial compensation or whatever. Just do it to move the culture forward. If you have information like that, or if you're a whistleblower, you know." Um, then make the decision and come forward for the good of your fellow citizens. Can I chime in on that? Yeah. You know, I was driving home the other day and I saw a big X in the sky of chemtrails. And I was like, oh. I, I can't believe at this point that these pilots are still doing this and that the people who, if it's not the pilots that are loading the planes with the chemtrails are still doing this for money and that <laughs> I was just thinking, how on earth can we get them to come forward to, to stop doing it and to whistleblow on this whole situation? Enough is enough. Wow. Incredible. Um, I think those channels of people should come forward, especially around that. My God, that program has been going on for so long. Well, everyone, it's been fantastic to be here with you. Uh, Miss Olivia Bravo. Excellent. <laughs> As per usual, we will be back with you next week. And um, remember, now mark it on your calendars, the following week, Memorial Day weekend, Friday night and Saturday night, we'll be here with you with a big two-parter. It's all about Blue, the real secret space program. And I'm going to bring real deep uh, pieces of information which have not been publicly aired before in relation to that. So 
We're looking forward to spending time with you there. We'll have another, uh, we'll have some great interviews and we have another special report coming up for you next week. So thank you so much. I'll do a couple of quick shout outs here for everyone. And of course we have more to get to as well. Let's see who we've got. Oh, it's going fast. <laughs> uh Oh, I like that one. It just says cool. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking. Oh, it's great. Katie cat, Karen Carpenter, Northern lights, Scarlet fire. What is that one? The pilots are told the spring for high tech surveillance and big pay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. Lioness of Gaia. Great show. Thank you. Unbelievable. DJ and Olivia, you guys are awesome. Keep up the great work. The Looch. That's great. Red Cap Goblin. Blue Chickens are yuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Much appreciated. DJ and O. Richard Hastings. Fantastic. Thackeray. Don Newway. There he is. He's out there. Oklahoma loves you. We love Oklahoma. I have a relative in Oklahoma. So um, it's Norman, Oklahoma. I have not been there, however. Good show. Good night, DJ and Olivia. Dorothy Pepino. Fantastic to see you. Corey Anderson, able bodied. The chem pilots are definitely the US reservists. Ha. Huh. Wow, they'd, they'd probably need that level of training. Excellent point. Canada loves you. Thank you, Thomas. We really love Canada. Really incredible. And I hope to see that repressive government out of business soon. Uh, dear Olivia, there's no pilot on most of those planes. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Somebody's got to know. Somebody <laughs> can open their mouth. Somebody's got the remote control joystick there. Um, Bob Bindert. Fantastic. Florida man. Florida man approves. Thank you very much. <laughs> Look at this. Susan Blackstone, thank you. Really appreciate it. Boy Max, Esoteric369. Thomas Bell. I know Kate's out there. It's great to see you. Yvonne7. Do we have Gigi out? We there? have Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf is there. Gigi Young's coming up. She's going to be on the show shortly. People are waiting for that one. It's going to be fantastic. Watch out. Isn't Blavatsky a fraud? No. <laughs> no, she wasn't. But uh, academia would sure like to push that idea. Very good job, Thomas Ball. Thank you very much, sir. Havadian is out there. Love you. Love you, too. Trident Vibes. Yes, there's energy out there. Great show tonight. Thanks, Josh Henry. Whew. Fantastic. We will see you all next week. And it's been great uh, to be with you. A lot more coming on X, the 2024 election, the UFO file. Wow. <laughs> Our cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, it says end broadcast. Hold after on. All. We have to acknowledge. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. Oh, yes. Fantastic. So all those wonderful moms, you're doing an incredible job that no one else could do. Fighting the baddies one day at a time. Thank you, DJ and Olivia. Mr. Wolf. Wow. Fantastic. Joseph P. Farrell. <laughs> Someone mentioned Farrell. Jen Passavant. Gigi's always fantastic, as are you. Thank you, Jen. Fantastic feedback. And I agree um, <laughs> with the Gigi part. <laughs> Olivia Wings Girl. Really great show. There you go. Trident Vibes. Back in action. Look at this. Fantastic group out there tonight. We'll see you all next week. And like I said, it says and broadcast but we know never really ends it never really ends and never let it be forgot once there was a camelot we'll see y'all next week god bless everybody have a great weekend and mother's day <laughs>